We're talking about unity in our passage. Last week we talked about how the church in Acts was together in heart and soul, heart and life, mind, belief, and living out that belief in togetherness with each other. This morning we're going to continue in that passage, and we're going to think about um, something that is tied to, very, very tied to unity that sprouts out of it, but it's a, a specific example of what some of that unity looked like. So would you please stand with me, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 32 through 37 together. <clears throat> it says, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would distribute to each as any had need. Now Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement, and who also owned a tract of land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. The word of the Lord. Amen. Would you raise your hands and pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the power of your word. Even earlier, Father, as many of us sat here in class before our worship, we heard the power of the skies, the power of the thunder, the power of the wind and the rain in this building. And Father, that's nothing. That's just a very, very small little bit of power in comparison to your power. Father, I pray that as we come to your word, we would recognize that we sit under it. And it is your intention that just like the elements that surround us in this world, that your power of your word that we sit under would direct our lives, that it would shape us, that it would change our actions, that it would strengthen us. Father, I thank you for the gift it is to preach your word. I pray that I would be faithful to it, be with my words, and be with all of our hearts together. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'm going to say that I think that there is a particular temptation that we face when we come to passages such as this in the Bible. There's a particular temptation when we read passages such as this, and I think that temptation is for me and for you to rationalize what the passage is saying to us. Do you ever rationalize situations? Do you rationalize the decisions that you make? I do. You don't want to how many, know how many years it was between my two last dentist appointments. You don't want to know. A long time. But guess what? When I went, not a single cavity. And guess what's happening now in my mind? Rationalization. If I went for 13 years between dentist appointments and on my schedule of flossing and brushing every third day, no, I'm just teasing. <laughs> I think I can milk out 18 this next round, right? That's the way it works. I'm the same way with doctor's appointments, right? Something hurts, oh, I'm not going to go rationalize, rationalize, rationalize. I've done it with money too. How many of you guys have gone to your wife and said, well, I had to buy it because it's going to save me money in the end. I'm the only one. You guys are all liars. <laughs> I remember my brother going MSRP on his wife. MSRP is, you know. We do this. We rationalize to our advantage. When we come to passages such as this, I think there's a particular temptation to rationalize what the Word of God is saying to us. We make our rationalizations based on, what, based on what? Well, what seems rational, logical, 
to us. It all, really often it comes down to who's, you know, who are you, whose logic and reasoning are you using as the basis for your rationale, right? 99.9% of the time it's our own. There are a lot of topics in the scripture that people want to rationalize away. Topics such as the roles of men and women, right? The Bible speaks to these things. It, it, it is not absent when it comes to the roles of men and women in family, societies, church. And yet, many times today, we want to rationalize away what the Bible says about those things or human sexuality, right? The Bible speaks to those things. The Bible is wonderful. It speaks to everything in your life. Everything is spoken to by the Word of God. It's His Word to you and to this world. But when the Bible says things that we, we don't want to hear, we rationalize it away. We sort of massage the point right out of it. In our lives, maybe it's not sexuality or the roles of men and women or a, a literal view of of God's judgment that we want to, to massage away, to rationalize. Maybe it isn't those things may, that are tempting us. But we are all tempted to rationalize. Our propensity to rationalize away what God has said based on our own opinion runs very, very, very deep. I think you'll recognize that God's trying to teach us something when in the garden, at the very beginning, Satan came to Eve and to, thereby to her husband, Adam, and he didn't say what? He didn't say, curse God and die, right? That was Lot's wife, Job's wife. Lot's wife. Now I'm having a, it's one of those times I'm in front of people, I'm not going to be able to remember who it was. I'll look it up later. Job, Job thank you. You've always backed me up. Um, he didn't, he didn't tempt Eve to saying, curse God and die. He said, is it really a bad idea, right? Did God really say? And what we're told is that when Eve, you know, every tree in that whole entire garden was given to Adam and Eve to eat freely from, except for a couple, right? And that being one of them. Can't eat from that one. But the passage says that when she saw that it was a delight to her eyes, Right? You, you, you read the rationalization going on in her mind. It's a delight to the eyes, and it's not just going to satisfy her hunger, but it's desirable to make one wise, right? There's like some really good benefits from this stuff over here. You hear the rationalization. She took and ate and then gave to her husband, and he ate. This is how common rationalization, bad rationalization is to the human heart, human mind. Our passage, I would suggest and argue, would be a prime target for such rationalization. And so I'd like to challenge you this morning right up front not to do that. I'd like to encourage you to let a passage such as this rock you. Grapple with what this passage is saying rather than read it and rationalize it away. Why, in your mind why you can't live in step with it, why you shouldn't do a similar thing. Let the wisdom of God seem crazy to you and then step out onto it and find that it holds you, that it's true, that it's strong, that it's secure. It's not going to fail. Find out that God is faithful and kind and a rewarder of those who are willing to follow after him. Last week I spoke about heart and soul unity. I reminded us that in an age that has embraced the idea of, you know, living and, and, and working in this sort of remote world in a generation that has really no use for dining rooms where you eat together anymore or front porches where you sit out after dinner to chat with your neighbors. In a time of very steep social collapse, especially among the young, part of the way we as Christians stick out and look different from the world is in the, this idea that the people of God are the people that have been born into one body. The people of God are people that are together in a very real sense. Not just in a sense of shared ideology or theology beliefs, but in life. 
worship, service, hospitality, love, to weep and mourn with one, and then to turn and to laugh and enjoy the goodness of God with another. This is part of our testimony as Christians in this world. This sounds good. We all like the sounds of that, but the devil's always in the details, isn't he? This week, I want to talk with you about something specific. I want to talk with you a little bit about the specific way in which their unitedness, their unity, their commitment to each other was seen, not just in general, something specific this morning. And it is this, in verse 32, no one, not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. I know what some of you are thinking. You know what you're thinking? That's communism. These early Christians were selling their possessions. They were holding all things in common. And they were breaking bread together. That's what it, this is sort of a repetition of something we heard a, a couple chapters ago in chapter 2. Eating together, sharing all things. And you might ask me, isn't that the definition of communism? I'd say no. And you'd say, why not? It seems like it to me. And I say, well, the text very explicitly says that they had food. <laughs> but really, in all seriousness, really, what we see here has nothing to do with the kind of primitive communism that some people throughout history have viewed this passage as. It's really amazing to me that anyone would read this passage and think uh, it's some sort of communistic experiment. It's, exact, it's the exact opposite. What is the difference between communism and what we see here? There's, there's one thing right in the passage, and it's, it's extraordinarily significant. In, it, it, in and of itself is enough to prove my point. Well, what is it? What took place here is entirely what? It's voluntary. It's voluntary. No one was forcing them to sell or to give what they had. In the next passage, we're going to read about Ananias and Sapphira who sell and, and they lie. They say, hey, we, this is the money we got. It's all, here's all the money. And Peter's going to say, wow, you owned that land. Was it not yours to do with whatever you wanted? You didn't have to sell it. You didn't have to give us all the proceeds. You could have given us 10%. You could have, it was yours to do with what you wanted. What we're reading about here was not coercion. It was voluntary from the heart of people's own volition. How much was voluntary in communistic Russia? How much is voluntary in China? Nothing is voluntary where communism reigns. This system communism carries out its purposes by the power of the sword, by power of force, and if you defy it, you're eliminated. That's the way communism works. The Christian community in our passage was the antithesis of communism. It was the opposite of communism. Communism imposes equality. In the early church, there was voluntary sacrifice, voluntary giving so that others could be lifted up. And there was rejoicing, mutual rejoicing in that. There was no fear, no threats, no coercion, only love and self-sacrifice to the glory of God and to the blessing of the church. That's what we're reading about in this passage. Christianity may not <clears throat> be communistic, but taken literally, what, what we read in these verses seems to be rather cult-like. I think many of you might read this and, and have such an idea. In fact, I've heard many jokes and lighthearted comments about how this passage seems very cultish. Like, hey, Nate, when were we building the commune? Right? I've thought such thoughts myself as I've read this, but I've been thinking about it more. A bunch of people joining together to do strange things like giving up their money, selling their land for the good of the whole. While I would argue that it is a sign of true health that any real Christian community be accused of being a cult from time to time. I think that's probably a good thing from time to time. 
At the core, Christianity and cults are fundamentally different, and here's why. Cults, at the end of the day, when you, when you strip away all the junk, they are about men. They are about man. They are about building you up, giving you what you want. We are to make much of Jesus Christ. Our aim is to glorify him, to love him, not to better ourselves. The good of the, the church is, does not exist to better ourselves. There are many benefits that flow through the church, and we are never to, to confuse the benefits and the goodness of God that come through the church with being a part of a church for what it does for us. A couple of years ago, we were driving as a family through Utah, and time after time after time, what did we pass? We passed these elaborate, beautiful Mormon temples. Right? They're all over the place. They're just absolutely beautiful. It was undeniable as you passed by, you thought, wow. A number of years ago, I remember my wife talking about this sort of like surge of Mormon mother influencers and blogs, and they kind of had the same effect as that driving along the roads in, in Utah, seeing all those temples. Everything seems so perfect and beautiful and and, you know, well-to-do. Like, I don't think any kids in those families ever scraped their ankle, their knees up or anything. Everything just looks so perfect. No one is poor. It's all attractive, and it's all part of being a, a part of the community. And again, it points inward. Mormonism is about making your life as great as it can be. I've talked with a couple of Mormons who I felt like were honest with me, and they've said that there is a lot of competition in the Mormon church. Competition plays a huge part of their religion. Much of what they do is motivated by comparison. They even register their tithe, what they give publicly, which I was just fascinated by to, to learn that, some of the stuff about the Mormon church, and I wondered why. But it makes sense if you recognize that they want to show what they're giving because it, in the end is, there is some reflection on them in what they're doing. It's about man, but this isn't limited to Mormonism. I'm just using it as an example. It's found in every cult and every religion where the where one true God is not loved and worshipped and feared. Notice also that the purpose of what's going on here is not just to care for each other's needs. Look at the, look at the passage. It says that there was no one that was needy. But ultimately, that's, that's, that's one of the wonderful side benefits of what's going on here. What is actually going on, it, it says that the apostles were giving powerful testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What we're reading about here isn't some organization that really helps those that come into it. Yeah, it, it does that. But no, we're reading about a community of people, the church, the body of Christ that loves the Lord Jesus Christ. He is their focus. Well, I recognize that many of us don't honestly view this passage as some sort of primitive passage on communism or, or cult. The fact that we can kind of understand it and we make jokes about it, um, I think shows that we view the way that we read about the church living here as strange or foreign. Can you admit that? Are you willing to admit that? Because of this, I want to warn us against rationalizing. I want, to, I want to warn us against rationalizing away the example and the teaching that passages such as this hold out to us. This isn't holding out some idealistic yet unrealistic picture of what Christianity is. This is what true Christianity looks like. This is the natural fruit of living out the teaching of Christ, living out the love for his church. This is the natural result. Do you, any of you remember Thomas Kincaid pictures? I'm sorry I had to bring that to your memory. I remember them being very popular when I was a kid. You could go and get them and, eat, you know, you could get a calendar of the year and every month you'd flip over and it'd be another one of his paintings. And his paintings, to my mind, you know, he nailed the AI-generated photos like 20 years in advance, you know, like that glossy sheen sort of like looks like an AI-generated version of The Hobbit, The Shire, you know. 
and it's got this like glossiness and this light just coming into the photo at just the right angle. I didn't really like them that much, actually. Actually, I think as a child I liked them, but it turned on me at, at some point. Every picture he painted has some serene, peaceful setting. It looked very attractive in a certain way, but it was completely unrealistic. You would never confuse his paintings for the real thing. Don't view the passage that we're reading this morning in the same way I viewed Thomas Kincaid paintings. The picture of Christianity that we see in this passage isn't a very nice, attractive picture, but not really very realistic. It's, it is the real stuff that we're reading about right here. This is what it looks like when men and women take Jesus seriously and live out his word. This is what happens when men and women are filled with the Holy Spirit in a way that causes them to live for heaven rather than to live for the things of this world that so quickly diminish in their importance. This is what it looks like for men to serve God rather than to serve money. So I'd like to make a couple points based off this passage about how we're to live and what God expects of us. I've talked a little bit about what Christianity is not. But now I need to speak with you about what Christianity is. The first thing is this. Christianity, the Christian life, is is a life of generous, radical giving. It is. We spoke about how they gave themselves to each other relationally. There was heart and life unity that bound all of these people together in friendship and love. Out of this giving of themselves came the giving of their possessions, their finances, to bless, to help, to strengthen the body of Christ. Verse 34, there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land and houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would distribute to each as any had need. Now at this time, there were many poor who were living in Jerusalem. Fishermen's, fishermen, rather, peasants, would often migrate from the areas around Jerusalem, Galilee, into Jerusalem, and they'd find it difficult living in the capital city away from their occupations at sea. In addition to this, what we know from historical accounts from Josephus and Tacitus is that this time in, in, in the history of the world was, was a bad time for Jerusalem's economic situation. It wasn't all that great due to a barrage of famines, due to unrest, it wasn't one of the, the times of, of great blessing in the life of the, the capital of Jerusalem. Add to this the fact that many who were attracted to Jesus, at least during his earthly ministry, were the, the poor, those who were overlooked, those that didn't have lots to offer, those that society had sort of had their way with, that they shunned, that they didn't really care about. And we start to get a picture of the church at this point start to get a picture of the church that would have many poor saints as a part of it. I'm grateful that God has brought into this church those that have means and those that do not. God has given us to each other. He has not given the poor to the rich without doing the same to the rich to the poor. He has given us to each other to help each other in ways that bring glory to God and blessing to his church. And I hope that we never become a church that is more likely to welcome somebody who may look like you than somebody who is obviously from a different state or stage of life. That's godless. We don't do that. The church is made up of the rich and the poor, that isn't what defines us anymore. When you come into the body of Christ, what defines you is that Christ is your Savior and your Lord. So I think it's a sign of good health to have a church where there's a, a, a beautiful mix and where the poor can be served by the rich and the rich can be served by the poor. 
You don't want to ever find yourself in a church where it's just the rich. It's a bad sign. I'm not saying that God's blessing on any one individual is, is wrong. God has his ways and his wisdom, and he, he, he does make some rich and others poor. But that's his prerogative. And we are to live in accordance with the scriptures in this world, fulfilling the role he has called us to fill. There were many godly, wealthy women who sustained the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. You recognize that those that cared most for our Lord and his time on earth were wealthy women. But Jesus himself was poor. Jesus was much closer to the man you might have seen loaded down with black trash bags on a bicycle than he was to you. You need to recognize that. But here's this incredible fact. There are rich and poor in the church in Jerusalem. And yet we're told that there were none who were needy in the church. This doesn't mean that everyone had the exact same amount of everything, the exact same amount of money in their wallets, the exact same number of outfits to wear. But it does mean that there was no need in the church of Jesus Christ. All needs were accounted for because of the radical giving and generosity of the church. We're told that those that own land or houses would sell them and take the money they received and lay it at the apostles' feet for wise distribution. This doesn't mean that every single person in the church sold their house and brought all the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. In fact, as we go through the book of Acts, what we're going to see is that many times it will reference a certain person's home specifically that they gathered in so-and-so's house to worship. It's, it's a, f- a fallacious idea to say that, oh, no one owned homes and they lived in a commune. That's not what's going on. What we're told is those that had land and houses would sell it to give and meet the needs of those that did not. They gave freely, without hesitation, without the expectation of being repaid, without the expectation of being compensated or reimbursed. They didn't ask for tax write-offs. They didn't seek to designate their giving. They didn't even ask for one of those little brick pavers in the driveway to have their name on it. And they gave this way for a couple of reasons. First, they understood, and this is important. I need to hear this. You need to hear it. They understood that they could not come after Christ unless they were truly prepared to give up the world. And they were. Giving up their earthly possessions and their wealth was the evidence that they understood what Jesus had taught. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow. He said, no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and mammon, wealth, money. When they followed after Jesus, they renounced the world and its pleasures. This means that they renounced their enslavement to wealth and to prosperity. Notice I say enslavement. Jesus says you can only have one master. The goal of being wealthy was anathema to them. And I say goal. The goal of being wealthy was anathema to them. If God gave them wealth, then praise the Lord, it's to be used. They would put their money to work for the good of the church rather than risk falling under the yoke of their money. They understood that they couldn't follow after Jesus unless they were prepared to give up this world. And that wasn't some sort of cerebral idea that was disconnected from their wallets and from their bank accounts. They understood the implications of what Jesus had taught his disciples, what the disciples had taught to the church. Remember the story of the rich young ruler? Rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, What must I do to inherit eternal life, Master? Jesus said to him at the end of their discussion, Well, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. The story ends in sort of a minor note. It says after that, the young man was saddened, grieved, 
because he was one that owned much property. You cannot come after Christ unless you are prepared to give up this world. The devil would have you believe that Christianity demands absolutely nothing from you. Salvation is a free gift. It doesn't cost you anything. Salvation is free. But here's the thing. If Christ is to have you, he is to have all of you. You can't give him half of yourself and keep the other half for your love of money. You can't serve both God and money. The idea, this idea is not some sort of religious ideal, but it is a Christian reality. Jesus calls you to give up many things to have him. If you aren't willing to give up everything for the, the sake of obtaining the one thing, then you fall short of what Jesus calls you to. That's the first reason. They understood that Jesus had said, you must be willing to give up if you were to have me. Second, they understood when Jesus called them to this sort of life that he was only calling them to something he exemplified in himself. He was only calling for them to imitate his example. There is no one who has given anything in comparison with Christ. In the giving of our lives, in the giving of our money, we are even at the greatest sacrifices of generosity, the greatest sacrifices of our rights or whatever we're giving up. At its very best, we are simply reflecting a small yet glorious way in which Jesus gave up of himself for you. Lest you think that this was a special time in the history of the church, that this was sort of a one-off situation we have the weight of history to go against us on this point, to keep us from rationalizing. Justin Martyr, famous Christian pastor, um, lived 100 to 150 years after, and in the second century he wrote, we who valued above all things the acquisition of wealth now bring what we have to common stock and share it with anyone who has a need. There was also a second century pagan um, named Lucian who wrote about Christians that they were ethically very moral, but his his observation of them is that he, he thought that they were easily duped by charlatans because they were so willing to give. He writes, they show incredible speed whenever any such public action is taken to arrest any, any of the Christians. For in no time they lavish their all. They despise all things indiscriminately and consider them pro- common property. He goes on to say, if any charlatan or trickster, able to profit by occasions, comes into their midst, he quickly acquires sudden wealth by imposing upon these simple folk. Now, this was a pagan's observation about the generosity of the church. This is decades, a century after what we're reading about in the book of Acts. This is not a one-off. This is not just some special instance. This was the character and is the character of the church of Jesus Christ. The Christian life is one of giving. That's the first thing. The second thing I want to say, the second point I'd like to make is that the Christian life is one of receiving. What do the people here receive? Well, there are those that received money. The poor were helped. Those that gave received the joy that came with giving. It is more blessed to give than to receive. But they all received something else as well. Notice in verse 33, it says this, and with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of Jesus, the Lord Jesus. That's what the apostles were doing. And then it says this, and abundant grace was upon them all. Abundant grace was upon them all. And when I read this, the thought that came to my mind was, this is, this is Jesus turning water to wine from heaven. That's what's going on here. The people give their money. They sell land, extra homes. And they give that money to the church to be used for the upbuilding of the, the people's lives 
And in return, what does God pour out? He pours out abundant grace. And so you and I are left with the question, what do we need more than the grace of God? Is there anything that is more precious, more valuable than having the grace of God abundantly poured out in your life? Is there anything that you want more for your children than for them to grow up along the banks of God's abundant grace? It's an incredible exchange. People give their money, utilitarian money, ultimately meaningless money, right? They give it to God. And what does he do for them? He gives them his grace. All needs were cared for, all were fed, all were clothed, all were provided for. And they had the abundant grace of God resting upon them all. Remember the rich young ruler I just mentioned a few moments ago. After he got the answer from Jesus and we're told he went away sad because he was very wealthy. He owned much property. Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, how hard will it be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words. Jesus answered again and said, Christ, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich man to enter into the kingdom. They were even more astonished, his disciples, astonished to hear him say this. And they say, then who can be saved? They despair. And looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people it is impossible, but with God, all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, behold, we have left everything to follow you. Jesus said, truly I say that there is no one, no one, not one, who has left house, brother, sister, mother, children, father, farms, for my sake, for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age. It's the crazy thing. In the present age, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Jesus' words are true. The Christian life is one of receiving. It is one of giving. It is one of receiving. Receiving Christ himself, peace with God, inheritance in the coming age, in heaven, the inheritance of Christ. And if that weren't enough, Jesus adds a you know, hundred times more even in this present life. A hundred times now? Do you believe that? A few months ago, my brother Isaiah told me that there was this bank account where, you know, I, I've had the same savings account since I was three, you know. And he told me, you know, you should be using the bank account I, I got. It basically guarantees you, you know, 4 or 5% interest, which was about 4 or 5% more than I had ever made on a savings account. So I thought, whatever, I'll, uh, you know. So that day, I didn't dilly-dally, you know, signed up and moved everything over. Sayonara, old bank, you know. That was for 4 or 5%, right? That's what I did. But Jesus says that it's on his word that you'll receive 100 times more. What you give, you will receive. And I don't wonder if I trust Isaiah about a, a, a local bank more than I trust Jesus on this point. And if you're willing to not rationalize, you need to have the same thought and wrestle with it in your mind. Do you actually trust the Lord when he makes a promise to you like that? The people in our passage did. How we rob ourselves when we rationalize away the opportunity to give to the Lord. Are you willing to trust God? Are you willing to trust God? I'll end there. Let's pray.